well we start with our lecture of general Tox toxicology 2 students are you getting my voice yes sir aapki awaaz clear hai okay uh, done, done. So. basically uh, in my previous lecture with reference to my last lecture we were talking about the toxicology and toxicology it is the component of forensic medicine and uh, we deal with the toxicology by different measures we decide whether uh, the person has taken the poison accidentally or suicidally or homicidally it has been given i told you that uh, the poison is any substance which when inhaled injected ingested produces harmful effect to the body is called poison the study of poison is called toxicology the poisons are being classified according to different classifications it is a mode of action classification that is a good classification and medical legal importance classification which is being dealt medically in case of uh, mode of action classification the poison which acts on any of the system or if it acts on the brain it stimulates the brain we call them stimulants like uh, amphetamine nicotinamide which depress the brain we call them depressants and uh, the different type of hypnotics and uh, sedatives are there diazepam and uh, barbiturates etc there are poisons which make irritation in the stomach uh, which called irritants or the poison which act on the myocardium of the heart we call them cardiac poisons like the nicotine digitalis saccharide the poisons acting on spinal cord making exaggerated reflexes stimulating the brain especially the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord are called the spinal poisons like uh, strychnine bruzine lignine so this is the way how we classify according to the mode of action the other classification is by the medical legal importance classification that uh, maybe the poisons are accidental in nature the poisons are suicidal in nature poisons are homicidal in nature poisons can be uh, infanticidal in nature poisons can be uh, cattle type uh, cattle poisoning uh, we give uh, different poisons there are different poisons which are being used as an abortifacient etc etc uh, this is the second classification without wasting more time we will go on uh, today's uh, part 2 and in part 2 basically we are going to diagnose the poison we are going to decide that what kind of a poison the person has taken if he is cooperative what we are going to do if he is not cooperating how we will manage so today my topic is uh, the management of poisoning or treatment of suspected case of poison basically you establish your diagnosis that which kind of a poison the guy has taken that's another story whether it is accidental suicidal homicidal that's another story but we need to decide whether it is acute poisoning or it is a chronic poisoning the person who is under the exposure for a longer time period it's a chronic poisoning or from two year two months to two years time it's chronic poisoning and if the person has just taken the poison and the signs symptoms has started and uh, the person is suffering from that particular poisoning the uh, is acute poisoning if he suffers from same time in the same time now the poisoning can be in living can be in dead you will have a patient reporting to you within couple of hours time maybe he will report late 
maybe he comes to you within two to four hours time, you will start with your management, uh, maybe he reports to you it, in such a state, sorry, in such a state that more time has passed, he has taken a sleeping preparation and uh, he has gone into deep sleep and you know, suspended animation is there. Vitals are on a very low pitch, respiratory center is being depressed and uh, you suspect that the person by establishing your diagnosis on the basis of history, signs, symptoms, laboratory investigation and the circumstantial evidence, you will establish a diagnosis that such a kind of a poison has been taken and you will start your treatment accordingly or uh, this is called a specific type of treatment. In few of the cases, the poison is not known to you. It is uh, a case of suspected case of poisoning. Maybe you are unable to decide what actually has happened. So you will go for a treatment of suspected case of poisoning. Before we proceed, you will have a living person and you will establish your uh, diagnosis of poisoning in a living person. Either it is an acute poisoning, either it is a chronic poisoning. In acute poisoning, the evidence of poisoning will depend upon whether the poison is, has taken just now and the science symptoms have started and uh, you will find that uh, the symptoms will start appearing just after an hour or uh, before an hour and uh, if suspected food or medicine or a fluid has been taken by a person and the symptoms usually come as about half an hour to one hour of the poison which has been taken in particularly food, drink or medicine. The symptoms are uniform in character they rapidly increase in severity as it will get absorbed slowly, gradually. The people who have taken that particular food, all of them will be suffering from that if uh, a contaminated food or a person has taken a toxic substance, most of the people will be suffering from that particular. The detection of the poison in the food, medicine, and uh, the vomitus will strongly prove that this kind of a poison has been taken. You must have heard or read in a newspaper that people has consumed su such a kind of a sweet which was made from such and such shop and they suffered from that poisoning. Maybe it is uh, any kind of a copper sulfate poisoning. Maybe the utensils were not being polished properly, etc, etc. Then you decide on a naked eye examination that sometimes you will find the patient reports to you. He is a living patient and he is vomiting and can give you, the vomitus can give you uh, valuable information like uh, if the vomiting is bluish green, then the copper sulfate has been taken, which we call Nila Kota. There will be Luminous in the dark with a strong odor of garlic causes because of the phosphorus. We have discussed before that because of the phosphorus, the later on postmortem liquid it comes to brown in color. And in case of a black vomiting, you will find that the conversion of hemoglobin into acid hematine, the vomitus will be, will be black in color in case of a sulfuric acid poisoning. Vomitus mixed with blood or shreds of uh, mucous membrane usually suggest that the corrosive or uh, strong irritants has been taken. You will find that the vomitus will be grayish in color and uh, mucus cont uh, containing blood, shreds or mucous membrane causes. These things will be like maybe the person has taken a mercury chloride or these kind of a poison. Vomitus material containing the ordinary contents of stomach but later contains mucus, blood, lakes or, or streaks or the spots. The color is dark brown and or a coffee ground in case of arsenic poisoning. Arsenic is the most common uh, type of a homicidal poison. In this a person will have uh, rice watery stools and there will be a vomiting and it will resemble just like a food poisoning. Then uh, 
you will find that uh, maybe in case of a datura poisoning, uh, you will, uh, because atropine is the active principle, you will use that kind of a poison and you will put in the eyes of the animal and it will show you that the positive signs, like dilatation of the pupil will be there. Then the circumstantial evidence has a great value. When a person, he attempts a suicide, he is not going to throw the bottle in a jungle, it will be lying on the bedside or maybe he has bought from a chemist, chemist shop. History will be available. Maybe at the time of stomach wash with the plain water, you will just preserve the first sample and you will send for the analysis and this will give you an idea. Diagnosis of chronic poisoning. When the person is under the exposure for a longer time period, he will develop chronic science symptoms. Like in carbolic acid poisoning, the brownish yellow ring around the cornea will be there in deposition in the ligaments and joint known as the uchronosis. In uh, chronic salicylate uh, poisoning known as the salicylism, like people who take more aspirin, this is uh, if they develop uh, tinnitus or maybe eczematous eruptions on the skin and it will develop, uh, you know, it will disturb the gastric mucosa and uh, will develop peptic ulcer. Then in chronic arsenic poisoning, there will be hyperpigmentation, white marks, raindrop appearance on the chest will be there. And uh, this is due to the hyper uh, melanosis. And this is known as the raindrop appearance. You will find that the nails will show the transverse bands and these are called the mese lines will be there. In chronic mercury poisoning, you will find that the mercury lentis will be there. And this is a deposition of this uh, mercury in the lens of the eye. There is a uh, dialism, uh, increased salivation due to painful stimuli, inflammation of the salivary gland. You will find that uh, the changes uh, are mercury tumors and mercury erythrism will be there in chronic poisoning. These are few, you know, exceptions. So these are a few things. When the person has been working somewhere, he is under the exposure for uh, years and years, or he is taking that particular drug for a longer time period, we're coming to the point. If he is taking for a longer time period, he will show these kind of findings over, over the person. I told you before that there will be signs, symptoms, fatal dose, fatal period. The signs, what you can see on the person, and in chronic uh, copper poisoning, you will find that the sunflower cataract will be there. And this is the only type of cataract which will be cured later on when you will use penicillamine. There will be metal fume femurs. These are uh, fever. These uh, are in inhaling the fumes of a copper for a longer time period. The person will have a respiratory complication and uh, that will uh, be killing of the liberating exotox uh, endotoxins producing symptoms which may resemble common cold and a flu. Moreover, you will find that the brown black lines on the junction of the gums and the teeth in case of a metallic poisoning, especially the chronic lead poisoning. And in chronic lead poisoning, there is anemia, peripheral neuritis, colic and constipation, risk drop, uh, foot drop, and there will be renovascular manifestation. There will be reproductive system manifestation. These are the you know typical findings, and we call that colic. And eighty percent of the people they report with the colic and constipation, and this is called painter's colic. In chronic silver poisoning, there will be deposition of the silver, which is known as the um, agrilia. Uh, uh, and uh, in chronic phosphorus poisoning, there will be a fossy jaw because of the deposition of the phosphorus uh, in the jaw, and there will be osteomyelitis, and there will be necrosis of the mandible with multiple discharging foul smelling sinuses. And fossy jaw is mostly seen in people working in the match factories. In uh, case of chronic poisoning by the thalidomide, uh, which is a tranquilizer used in the First World War. And uh, those pregnant ladies who, uh, who used it gave birth to a children having uh, seal fish like uh, extremities known as the uh, phopomelia. And in chronic thallium poisoning, 
those people who are working with the, at the thallium scan or at the radiation centers, at the atomic energy centers, especially the doctors and the technicians who are under the exposure for these um, rays and in chronic thallium poisoning, there will be alopecia, loss of body hair, especially the scalp hair will be one of the uh, typical finding, chronic finding. In nickel poisoning, there will be nickel eczema. In chronic ergot poisoning, there will be ergotism. There is a burning sensation uh, on the skin, and this is called St. Anthony's fire. In chronic opium poisoning, this is known as the morphinism or morphinomania. There is a pale face, insomnia, and iritis leading to wrist drop and ankle drop and potency. In chronic barbiturate addiction, there is a barbiturate automatism. That person, he forgets that he has taken a drug. One point is all these drugs, all these drugs of addiction, you need to keep on increasing the dose of the drug because it develops tolerance. And uh, barbiturate, maybe this old man who's taking the drug, he takes that drug, goes to sleep, unable to go to sleep. He feels that I have not taken the medicine. He will go and take another dose. So uh, keep on taking like this. This is called the barbiturate automatism. In chronic alcoholism, there will be condition called delirium tremens. And these, this is all called Korskov psychosis. In chronic cases of cannabis syndica, the person will develop run amok type of uh, feeling that he uh, goes and kills his enemy. Later on, he kills himself or he surrenders himself to the police. In chronic cocaine poisoning, cocainomania or cocaine bug feeling will be developed. And this is also called magnus symptom, feeling of insect crawling over the skin. He will keep on scratching over the body. And this is called the uh, magnus symptoms. You will find that the, those people who are taking cocaine and uh, snuffing the cocaine and they develop the perforation in the nasal septum. And in chronic conine poisoning, there is a, a conine retinopathy leading to blindness and psychosis or hemolytic anemia or Boston tinnitus or what type of it. Now, the thing is, this is all acute poisoning. Just now he has taken a poison. He has land, landed into a situation that the person uh, has developed poisoning. Maybe he is vomiting. Maybe he is uh, having a diarrhea. Maybe the person is having some kind of uh, allergic reaction over the skin. Maybe the person is in an unconscious state and has landed into a comatose state. And uh, when the person is in a comatose state, has been brought to you. You have to make your diagnosis. You have to establish your diagnosis that what kind of a poison he has taken. No proper history is available. So diagnosis of a poisoning in living and diagnosis of poisoning in dead is being done by you. First, we exclude this dead body. Diagnosis of poisoning in dead is made from history is available. Post-mortem appearance is there. You will go for chemical analysis. You go for experiments on the animals. Maybe the circumstantial evidence will be there who has been brought with the patient. So you will be the one who's going to establish your diagnosis. He's in a comatose state. You will take the history. You will look at the signs and symptoms. You will send the blood for laboratory investigation. Maybe circumstantial evidence is there, like in case of barbiturate poisoning like in case of a snake bite, like in case of uh, any other poison, a person has developed. Maybe you feel that it is a diarrhea. Maybe you feel it is a food poisoning, but basically that was an arsenic poisoning. And unless and until you go for a removal of the poison, unless and until you give an antidote, the symptoms will persist over there. Management of poison in a living person. You always receive a patient and you try to establish your diagnosis. But before that, you go by three lines of treatment. One is emergency treatment. Second is specific treatment. And the third is symptomatic treatment. In emergency treatment, you look for the vitals. You look for the pulse. 
respiration, blood pressure, temperature, hypothermia, hyperthermia, arrhythmia, fits, coma. You look for the vitals. You make sure that patient survives. When he is in your hand, he is in a safe hands. If the secretions are there, you will clear the airway. You will clear the airway with the cloth or you will clear the airway with the suction tube. If the patient is having hypothermia, you will cover with the blanket. Hyperthermia, you will remove the blanket, open the fan, start with the cold sponging. So you look for the respiration. You look for the blood pressure. If he is ever having a hypovolemic shock, you make the foot end raise, you maintain the IV line. You look for all these things and uh, you try to give the emergency treatment. Now, the patient can have a poisoning because of the inhalation, ingestion, injection, or skin contamination. Like for example, when you enter your house, you will find that maybe the Masi is lying in a kitchen. She has developed some kind of, she has taken some kind of irrespirable gas or has produced respiratory embarrassment, lying unconscious on the ground. You'll just take her out in an open air, etc. Or if the person who has got a poison over the skin, you will wash with plenty of the water. If the patient is having some kind of other emergency, you will refer the patient to the hospital. And in a hospital, you go by this, these three lines of treatment. Now, after making sure the vitals, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, temperature, hypothermia, hypothermia, arrhythmia, fits, coma, these things you will just keep in your mind and you will just make sure and you will maintain the IV line. Now you will try to go for a specific treatment. You try to establish your diagnosis. What kind of a poison has been taken? I told you in few of the cases, sometimes you are unable to decide that what kind of poison is again, then you will go for general management of poisoning. But when uh, you establish your diagnosis on the basis of history, sign symptoms, laboratory investigation, circumstantial evidence, you will be able to reach that what kind of a poison because we have already discussed that acute poisoning is there, chronic poisoning is there. It is in living, it is in dead. We have already discussed that maybe there are a few of the volatile substances which evaporate from the lung and like uh, benzene, petrol, kerosene, alcohol, these kind of things which evaporate and whole of the ER will be full of smell, maybe even the insecticide, organophosphorus compound or maybe alkyl group, aryl group, or a DDT. DDT has been oscillated these days. Because you, when you will go in fourth year, you will come to know why the DDT is not being in a use. So I'll give you just one example that uh, the mosquito got resistant to it. So the, you will be establishing a diagnosis in living and a dead in a living person. You will find that the person is hyper excited person is hilarious, he is talkative, and he is abusive, and maybe he is in a stage of excitement, he has taken an alcohol, maybe the person has taken a barbiturate or a diazepam, he was in, uh, he's not willing to stay more, he wants to attempt suicide, taken 10 tablets, maybe uh, when uh, unable to wake up, maybe mother has uh, tried to wake him up, but he is drowsy, he is semi-conscious, maybe he is in a comatose state. The respiration is there, but it is slow and shallow. Maybe he has taken some kind of a drug, etc. So you establish your diagnosis on the basis of sign symptoms. Those which stimulate the brain, we call them stimulants and the stimulants, we have to control that. Those which has gone into depression, we have to give supportive treatment, we have to give coramine, we have to give supportive treatment, and we have to uh, treat the patient, we have to give the emergency treatment. 
So a specific treatment is being done on the basis of four lines. You will take the history, you look for the sign symptom, you will look for the laboratory investigation, and you look for the circumstantial evidence. By looking at the signs, what you can see, symptoms, what he mentions you, you will establish your diagnosis on these four lines. When you establish your diagnosis that she has taken organophosphorus compound, some kind of a bad smell is coming from the breath, or maybe the patient is vomiting, or maybe the temperature is very high. We have discussed in previous class that dhatura is one of the poison, which is a stupefying poison, which is being used for kidnapping, robbery, pickpocketing, and it is being given where the stay of a person is very short, like uh, exhibition, mela, or uh, maybe railway stations. So the temperature will be have very high because Datura has got an atropine as in its scopolamine. Atropine, it is anticholinergic in action. It is stimulates free center of the brain. It depresses free center of the brain. It is stimulates the heat regulating center. And it uh, make the dryness for certain saliva. Body temperature will be very high. So you establish your diagnosis on the basis if the person has take, been given or the person has taken for uh, aphrodisiac reasons like uh, strychnine, he will be he has taken a larger dose and uh, which is being used by the Hakim. Basically, strychnine or a maxformica, it is an animal poison which is being given for to the stray dogs to kill the stray dogs by the Karachi Municipal Corporation. But it is also a CNS stimulant. It is being given by the Hakims uh, in a small amount, which stimulates and which is used as aphrodisiac reason. And uh, maybe the person has taken a larger dose and he got exaggerated reflexes because it stimulates the brain, especially the anterior horns of the spinal cord, making exaggerated reflexes like the opacitonus, plurisitonus, amprocitonus condition, rises sardonicus condition, like facial muscles will become tense and the person will be having these kind of uh, uh, fish type of, uh, or maybe tetanus type of, uh, or the, uh, the, you know, features will be there, you will establish your diagnosis on a history, or etc. Maybe the person has been bitten by a snake or something. It's another story that maybe the snake was poisonous or non-poisonous. Most of the snakes all over the world, 80% of the snakes are non-poisonous. God has given the venom to the snake for uh, getting hold of a prey and uh, not biting a human. But when it bites human, it bites and runs away. Maybe the fatal dose has not been given. Maybe the animal was not poisonous. Maybe the animal was coming from hibernation period, etc., etc. The guy who has reported to you, and he is shouting, "I have been bitten by a snake." He is, you know, very much anxious. He is very much, uh, you know, in a in a stress. You reassure the patient, you immobilize that part, you just take the blood, you send for the analysis. And after, you know, 10, 20 minutes, you will get the report that this poison is in the stomach, uh, in, the, in the circulation. You will go for that treatment. So the point, what I'm trying to tell you is specific treatment is when you establish your diagnosis, pinpoint diagnosis, if your diagnoses are good, your treatment will be good. Obviously, you will establish your diagnosis on these four lines. When you will establish your diagnosis, then if the patient is cooperative, you will try to produce MSS. And uh, depending, if the patient has reported to you within an hour, one or two hours time, you will ask the patient to put the finger in the glottis and vomit it out. Maybe you will try to produce MSs by giving syrup of a pig. Maybe you will give, a, uh, so the poison, which is over in this slide, you are going to remove the poison by two ways. One is uh, by producing vomiting or MSs. Other is by stomach wash that is called gastric wash. Then you will, uh, then after that, you will give uh, the patient, you will clean the area if it is on the skin, if it is uh, 
um, having uh, he's having problem with the respiration you will put uh, the patient on uh, on the oxygen or maybe then you will give use antidotes but before that the patient is cooperative, you will produce the MSCs mechanically or maybe you will use syrup of pig or a warm water. There, there are different other products which you are going to use for producing MSCs. And when you will produce MSCs, the poison which has gone in the stomach will come out and you will collect the first sample for sending for the analysis. Right? I hope you are with me. So I'm not going too fast. Then. When you produce MSs, after producing MSs, patient is cooperative, but maybe the patient is not cooperative. He is hysterical. He is not cooperating with you. Then you will go for a stomach wash. And uh, in case of uh, uncooperative patient, gastric lavage has been done. And the poison which was lying in the stomach, you try to take it out by producing MSs, and uh, you will be removing if the patient is not cooperative you will be doing the stomach wash stomach wash has been done by stomach wash tube and uh, this is about the MSS that ingestion of the poison if he reports to you within a couple of hours time uh, to one hour two hour time you will try to remove it by parental route oral route Various domestic emetics are, I told you, warm water, or maybe uh, you will use mustard mixed with warm water, or maybe salt water with a warm uh, salt with the warm water uh, you will use, and uh, the person will vomit it out. Then the gastric lavage is being done. This gastric lavage is uh, basically life saving. This is the best method for removing the poison which is lying in the stomach which has not gone to the circulation not been absorbed and up to four hours time you can do go for a stomach wash there are few indications of stomach wash that is if the patient is not cooperative patient is hysterical patient is uh, or there are few contraindications of the stomach wash like maybe the strychnine we just discussed because of the exaggerated reflexes, uh, you will not do the stomach wash. In case of corrosive, you are not going to do the stomach wash because maybe you will make perforation or ulceration, etc. And uh, in a comatose patient, maybe there will be chance of aspiration pneumonia. So the stomach wash, basically, it is a tube which is 1.5 meters uh, in length and uh, 0.5 centimeters in uh, diameter. It is simply 50, 55 centimeter long tube, 50 centimeter long tube. You will put the patient in a semi-prone position, feet on slight height, head on the left side. You will just insert through the mouth or nostril. If you put through the mouth, the person will clench. So you have to use the mouth gag for that. But most of the time we are inserting through the nostril and uh, we just moist it. We just start putting through the nostril and we ask the patient to swallow. If he is cooperating well, otherwise you just put a drop of water uh, in the mouth with the reflex, he will swallow. And uh, when he is swallowing, you will be inserting this tube inside and uh, you will keep on inserting. There is a mark after halfway, there is a mark, which is called 30 centimeter mark. You will insert up till that point and you will stop putting inside after 30 centimeter. Now, you will be having one end in your hand, you will load big syringe, which is called catheter tip, and you will load with the air and you will push inside by putting a stethoscope over the stomach. You will hear the sound and the person will push the air inside when you get the gurging sound, that means it's in the stomach. If you get a hissing sound or no sound comes, that means it has rolled down in the mouth, maybe it's gone into the lung. So when you get the gurging sound, that means it is in the stomach. And when you have a practice, you just put very smartly and uh, you just uh, put a sticking. And uh, now you will be using, you will be using a plain water it's because stomach was as 
there are indications and contraindications same way the stomach wash is of different type one is for diagnostic reason one is for treatment reason in case of diagnostic reason you will take the plain water and you will push inside twice thrice you will push inside then you will lower down the tube when you lower down the tube with a suction it will be coming just like when you take petrol from the tank of a car and with the suction the tube the contents and the fluid or the water will be coming out you will collect the first sample for sending for the chemical analysis and after that you will repeat the same thing and you will keep on doing the same thing we just pushing the water and um, now depending on the type of poison maybe some kind of uh, vegetable poison is there you will use potassium permanganate solution and uh, which is pink in color you will push inside lower down the tube then again you push inside then lower down the tube first sample you have collected for sending for the chemical analysis and for your safety for patient safety for diagnostic reason and after that for treatment reason you will be using potassium permanganate solution or any other solution or a warm water in case of oily substances you are going to do the stomach wash for up till the time the clear fluid comes or not more than 20 minutes time otherwise you will disturb the you know uh, or you will make me you will make the perforation ulceration etc so the procedure or lavage is that certain specific steps are been taken you will make a semi prone position of the patient you introduce the tube inside you will confirm that the tube is in the stomach you will do the lavage of the stomach and uh, there are few of the contraindications i told you that uh, make me crosses maybe some kind of a spinal maybe and also you don't do in case kerosene oil poisoning because of the laryngeal spasm is there and you don't do the stomach you you, you just uh, there are few complications of uh, stomach wash that aspiration pneumonia will be there or maybe you will make a uh, injury to the gastric mucosa then when the poison which is lying in the stomach you have taken it out in a cooperative patient and the poison which is lying in the stomach in cooperative or uncooperative patient the patient the, the poison which is lying in the stomach you try to remove it by stomach wash and stomach wash you have done with the stomach wash tube and you have done up till the clear fluid comes or you have done with the warm water and you you have you done done it the poison which has gone into the circulation and because of which the signs symptoms are appearing you are going to use an antidote for that to so administration of antidote antidotes are the remedies which counteract against the poison antidotes are the remedies which counteract against the poison and there are different type of antidotes available and uh, these are these type of antidote according to the mode of action they are physical or mechanical antidote they are chemical antidotes they are physiological antidote there are universal antidotes and there are chelating agents i'll give you just few examples because it will become very lengthy we can have a whole lecture on antidotes and antidotes are being used in a poisoning unit and uh, maybe in case of uh, organophosphorus compound patient has been kept on uh, oxymes or atropinization is being done he is being kept on these antidotes for a longer time period and uh, but the physical or mechanical antidote is when the acid is being ingested the person will be given uh, like a dimmel scent like butter ghee oil which will enter inside will cover the walls of the stomach and will not allow the poison to act on the wall these are the mechanical antidote they act mechanically they just stand in front of the poison and they act mechanically then chemical antidotes are there physiological antidotes are there pharmacological antidotes are there i give you example pharmacological antidote like if the person has taken the opioids opium and its alkaloids like morphine codeine pethidine heroin dynein narcotine you must have read in a 
Lippincott about uh, the opioid and uh, uh, analgesic antagonists, uh, etc. They how they act? They act by using their receptors like a mu kappa sigma receptor. They go and they take the receptor and they make the action potential. But we are giving an antidote which is called as a nilorphine or naloxone hydrochloride. Very important medicine, very important drug. And the nilorphine or naloxone hydrochloride come in the market with the name of Narcan. Uh, our book says you will give 20 ml IV, 20 ml IM, 20 ml in the trip. But when you inject this, the mode of action is it has more affinity to the receptor, will take the receptor, mu kappa sigma, and will not allow the poison to take the receptor, just like we have a carbon monoxide, which has, we have studied from Genon and other books. It has 200 times more affinity, and uh, it takes the oxygen receptor, does not allow, it decreases the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Same way, in, in case of opium, it will uh, have an antidote that is nilorphine coming in a market with the name of Narcan. It takes the receptor. It has an affinity to the receptor for 24 hours time. And uh, the poison will be looking for the receptor every time bypassing from the liver, getting detoxified, and the level of the poison will be slowly coming down. So that was a pharmacological antidote. Then we have, if the nature of the poison is not known to you, if the nature of the poison is not known to you, then you are going to use universal antidote. The universal antidote uh, has... Excuse me, sir. Yes. I have to finish quickly. 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 Okay. So, okay. Okay. Uh, बहुत शॉर्ट टाइम दिया हुआ आपने वैसे तीन लेक्चर वहाँ थर्टी टू फोर्टी मिनट हैं हाँ वो भी मैंने अभी पूछा कि तीन लेक्चर हैं कि दो लेक्चर हैं एनीवे आई एम जस्ट आई एम जस्ट पुटिंग इट सो आई एम सॉरी स्टूडेंट्स बेसिकली दिस टॉपिक वाज ऑफ थ्री लेक्चर्स बट जस्ट यू नो हाफ आवर बिफोर I was going. I was supposed to start this lecture. I came to know that there are two lectures only. Anyway, this is the most important part. What we are talking about. Before that, I was trying to make you understand that um, acute and uh, chronic poisoning. But the antidotes are being used. Universal antidote. It is when you don't know the nature of the poison. You use universal antidote, and universal antidote has three parts. One is the activated charcoal. Two parts charcoal. One part magnesium oxide, one part tannic acid. So these were going to absorb the alkaloid, neutralize the acid, etc., etc. Then we have the chelating agents which are being given against the heavy metals, and these uh, are the things which make the poison drain, make them inactive form, and they drain the poison through the urine. And these are the chelating agents, and they act on absorb metallic poisons which are in the in the body etc and um, the examples of the chelating agents are bl british antidote levocide and uh, edta ethyl diamine tetraacetate penicillamine and desferoxamine these are the chelating agents which are commonly being used against the heavy metals lead mercury copper etc etc this is a detail about it a basic thing is that they make the poison into inactive form and they mobilize the poison from the body and when you keep on checking the urine you will find that the uh, maybe if it is a lead lead mobilization test will be there there are any questions for yeah please repeat uh, the exam, example of uh, uh, Minha has asked a question that about the mechanical antidote. Me mechanical antidote, just catch the word mechanically, they are just covering the walls of the stomach, not allowing the poison to act on the wall. And that is uh, like uh, butter, ghee, oil, etc., etc. Basically, the, all these chelating agents, their mode of action is they make the poison they make the poison any other question so this is the dose these are the side effects of and this is the edta which is commonly being used 
like uh, EDTA, we are using BAL, we are using three milligram per kilogram body weight. EDTA, we are using one milligram per kilogram body weight. And we are putting this in a drip and we are reducing the dose to 50% every second to third day. And we will withdraw the dose later on. And uh, penicillamine, um, there's one thing called activated charcoal. Charcoal is uh, which adsorbs the alkaloid. It covers the thing. It does not absorb. It just adsorbs the alkaloid. And this is uh, the typical example is a burnt toast in uh, example of uh, activated charcoal. This is a mode of action procedure. Sir. Then any other question? Example of physical. Any other question? Hmm? No question? Okay, so this is the basically about the treatment and management of poisoning.